So hello and welcome to Cinema Eclectica, part of the Geek Show Podcast Network. We are the Geek Show's dedicated movie podcast. I'm Graham and this week I've been joined by... Bob, hello there, Graham. Hello there. And uh, we've got a bit of an announcement, if you didn't hear last week's podcast. On the Halloween show in three weeks' time, we are going to wind down Cinema Eclectica and make it an a sort of an irregular Patreon exclusive, I guess. That's about as far as our talks yeah. have got. We'll have to develop what Eclectica is going forward. Mm. Um, but I will say one thing, with that being the case, I think if you're a long-term listener, you'll know when we do our Halloween special, we don't just do, oh, let's watch some horror movies mm. or something. Mm. We we theme them. Um, I think we've got Italian um, world horror, uh, weirdo horror. We've got all sorts of themes in the past. I think we're going to have to make this one a doozy. That's a very good point. Yes, we will. Yeah. Uh, if it, it felt like a good time to bow out for that reason, but we are coming back with another film podcast in the new year, which is Pop Screen, a new series about movies starring or about pop stars, rock stars, hip hop stars, country, jazz, anything you like. Uh, and every week we'll analyse a different movie about pop music, pop musicians and the pop industry, uh, which is the most times I've ever said pop, I think. And knowing Graham like I do, I can guarantee at this point, not every week is going to be about David Bowie, so you're okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's more yeah, people we, who've done them. <laughs> we, we guarantee a ceiling of 60 70% Bowie. That's, that's our limit. We will step no further. <laughs> that's it. It's... <laughs> the most you will to bow down to. <laughs> yes, that's coming in the new year and we're all very excited about it. But before that, we've still got a couple of uh, weeks to run on our director's lottery feature, which has been a part of this show since 2016, I think. Wow, we've been doing it that long, yeah. The first time we ran it, it came out with Dario Argento, which as first times go is untouchable, I would say. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was a Tenebrae that I think we did. Yes, yes, it was. Uh, that was one of our favourite directors under consideration. This week, we've got a director that neither of us is as familiar with as we should be. Yeah, a Sam Peckinpah. I've seen one of his movies twice and um, bring mm. me the head of alfredo garcia now my my thing about that is just nihilism through and through mm. and I, I think a line i wrote in the review was i am not in the business of recommending you watch a movie for one performance but warren Oates is amazing in that yeah beyond that though i've never really felt compelled to really get into sam peck and Pa's filmography i'll be honest well, I have. I just haven't known where to start. I saw Straw Dogs when uh, many, many years ago, and it really put me off. I think Straw Dogs is a really ugly film. But I do, as anyone who heard our Stagecoach episode a couple of weeks back knows, love westerns, and I felt for the longest time that I really need to watch Peckinpah because he had a huge influence on that genre. So with that in mind, we didn't choose a Western. Well, there was two you could have picked for the Western. There's, there's yeah. the Wild Bunch and, oh, what's the other one? Um, I, could, I could have gone for Ride the High Country. I was thinking about Ride mm -hmm. the High Country. Yeah, but he, he's also, he was operating in sort of the 60s and 70s. Mm. Um, more prominent at that time was... I guess, nihilistic uh, crime movies. Yeah. So yeah. we went with probably his best known one, The Getaway from 1972 with Steve McQueen. Mm, which was one of his highest grossers. I mean, his, his films were not always commercially successful. McQueen said that he, he'd done Peckinpah's previous film, uh, I think it was Major Dundee. He said it was one of the few films that I was in that just lost tons of money. But he nevertheless felt that when he got the rights to Jim Thompson's novel about uh, ex-convict and his librarian girlfriend who's plan to do a big, easy money heist and then get away to Mexico goes 
like these things always go. Um, he thought that Peckinpah should do it. Do you know who was originally lined up to direct this, by the way? Oof. No idea. Um, Hal Ashby. See, that would make sense. That would make a lot of sense. That would certainly make more sense than giving it to Peter Bogdanovich. Y yeah. <laughs> yes, it would. <laughs> but he did do Target, so he does have some sort of crime cinema in him. I guess, yeah, the early Bogdanovich films can be kind of tough. I, I guess I'm just thinking by this time he was making stuff like What's Up Doc and At Long Last Love, you know, those famous two-fisted tales of men of violence that they have. Uh, he also did later, but Paper Moon, which is just a masterpiece Paper as far as I'm great. concerned. Yeah. Yeah, certainly nothing against Bogdanovich, but he is a weird fit for this material. Uh, yes. Peckinpah isn't... He is a very, very normal fit for this material. Uh, have you ever read any Jim Thompson, by the way? Um, no, no. He feels sort of cut from a cloth that you could compare to Carmack McCarthy, that sort of very mm. working class, very grim American South. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the thing with Thompson that McCarthy never had to put up with is that Thompson made his living as a sort of pulp author. So he had to turn out stuff by the yard. And so... Yeah. For every really great Jim Thompson novel, there are a load of others that just feel identical to me. But The Getaway is kind of an interesting one because the ending is so bananas. I mean, the ending in this is nothing like it at all, largely because I, I guess even Sam Peckinpah looked at it and thought, right, so spoiler warning for a book published in 1958, they get away, but it's a kind of a weird scam cult, and the only people in the village nearby are... It's a village of cannibals? What the hell are you on about, Jim? That's a left turn. Yeah. <laughs> I prefer the way it ends in the movie, to be honest. The, the movie kind of ending hopeful. is... Yeah. It's unusually positive for pecking pie, isn't it? Yeah, and it's also got Slim Pickens, and Slim Pickens is great. That's very true, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, how, how did you feel in general about it, would you say? Um, it's kind of a hard movie to sort of get behind. Uh, it's a case of, I could describe what this movie is. Um, it's about uh, Steve McQueen, who gets out of jail. He gets his parole, and he's offered by the the um, prison warden to do one job for him. Mm. Obviously goes badly. It's a crime movie. Of course it does. And then essentially it's a lovers on the run movie, but a lovers on the run movie in which the lovers hate each other. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That is very true. Um, but a lot of it is just them sort of saving and covering up for mistakes and not saying much to each other. So I could say it's really grim. They don't say a lot to each other. And I kind of had a hard time with it. But complaining about something which it was setting out to do is kind of internet criticism, Twitter level, yes. I think. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's quite weird tonally, I think, because what you say about it having this kind of bleak, angry quality is kind of true. And anyone who thinks that Peckinpah was just like an inveterate misogynist is, you're not going to find much to challenge your view here. Steve McQueen punches a lot of women in this movie, like a lot. Like, yeah, there's like a shooting and then he spends about a minute slapping her. So like, why did you do that? It's, yeah, it's, it's awkward to watch. It's Nicolas really... Cage in the Wicker Man remake levels of woman punching. Yeah. Um, but also the mood of it is kind of jazzy and relaxed in a weird way. Yeah, the scar. Oh wow, the scar <laughs> by uh, Quincy Jones. Is it? <laughs> yes. It's incredible. Oh wow, it's not like a scar to make music it's it's a mood piece and yeah. it elevates this thing so much it's incredible sequence on the train it's just i don't know what he's doing what he's playing but it's just wonderful this the soundtrack is 
as astonishing as Rob's making it sound. I I think we're probably going to swear a bit on pop screen. I've been fighting shy of it just because okay. we, we started off not doing it. And I think it would be too much of a left field turn. So listeners, consider this us easing you into the new style of the show. Here, um, here is an excerpt from my notes for the getaway. <laughs> <laughs> The soundtrack to this has a fucking didgeridoo. It does, yes. <laughs> Don't know where that come from. Why does Quincy Jones have a didgeridoo? Why is there a Deep South crime movie with a didgeridoo on the soundtrack? I don't also, know why it works, but it works. For that, the mm. first things up in the credit are male voices and an instrument player before any of the actors, before the directors, before anything of that. Mm-hmm instrumentalists are first in the credits, which I think is very telling to how important the score is to making this thing work. Completely, yeah. And Peckinpah apparently had the score kind of imposed on him. He wanted to work with one of his regular composers, but I don't know whether it was McQueen who had final cut privilege who said no, but it makes it less Peckinpah, but it makes it work. I think without the score, it'd kind of be very workaday. Mm. Sort of, there's lots of this sort of miserableist um, 1970s, in a in a city crime things. Uh, the Friends of Eddie Coyle, yeah, for example, is is another one you could cite. But they're not pleasant. But that score gives it such a unique identity, mm. which I think is worth its weight in gold. I mean, you talk about identity. This is kind of an interesting one to be doing as director's lottery because Peckinpah's voice artistically is not really the strongest thing in here, I think. No. It feels a bit Jim Thompson-y. It feels a lot like a Steve McQueen movie. It obviously has that Quincy Jones tonality to it on the soundtrack, which is very strong. It also has a script by Walter Hill. Yes, who is another one of those um, 1970s... Well, he just is is a script man. He had scripts Mm. for all sorts, and this feels a lot like his movie from a similar era, I think, The Driver. Yeah, yeah. I like this a lot more than The Driver, but yeah, there's a very... Walter Hill feeling to this more than a Peck and Palmer feeling, I felt. Yeah, yeah, I th- think that's probably true, actually. I think the in terms of Thompson's work, the most authentically Thompsonian touch is the, just right at the start, how ridiculously horny Steve McQueen is and how absolutely desperate he's become in prison when you think, yeah, that's that's kind of a Jim Thompson story, isn't it? Yeah, yes, it is. It's a weird performance from Steve McQueen, though. You think? Well, it was in 1972. He didn't die long after this, did he? After I suppose, his, his, yeah. his final yeah. run of movies. Um, But when I think of Steve McQueen, I always think of the, the movie star. Yeah. This is not a movie star movie. This is... This is a grindhouse movie, if I was going to use any sort of um, cinematic term to, to lump it in with. Yeah, this, I get that. Yeah. This is more Reservoir Dogs than um, something else, like an opposite of Reservoir Dogs. I don't know. Um, but it's not kind of, uh, I guess, the, the sort of archetypal crime movie as big popcorn entertainment thing of its generation would probably be the Italian job, right? Which is light, frothy, pop arty, great fun for all ages. And this is, as we've said, a Sam Peckinpah movie. Not the Sam Peckinpah-iest Sam Peckinpah movie, but it is definitely a Sam Peckinpah movie. Steve McQueen in this is hateful. And I think that's kind of the point. Uh, Mm. Because there's another aspect of it which... Kind of humorous, I guess, but humorous in a way where somebody who's got a serial history of being a misogynist would think it'd be funny. Mm. Um, because there's three men in the job. Um, yeah. There's Steve McQueen. I can't remember who the other actor is, but there's another veteran, a mustachioed veteran, we'll call him. Oh, yeah. He, he kind of looks like uh, they wanted Burt Reynolds and then they went, OK, get me someone who looks a bit like Burt Reynolds if you squint. So, so this actor is Burt Reynolds. 
And there's a young kid who cares more about his hair. Obviously, it goes bad for the kid. Yeah. Um, you think that Rert Benolds is dead, <laughs> but he spends the rest of the movie chasing after him. And there's these little interjections of scenes with them two. Yeah. Which, again, playing into that sort of torn thing, they're all over the place because there's a scene with them. That they got a doctor to drive them to uh, New Mexico, I think it was. Yeah. And there's a scene where they're just throwing chicken wings at each other. Oh, yeah, yeah. What is that? And where does this come from? This is all over the place. I must admit, I have been thinking about movie stardom a lot in terms of a movie star being someone who can compel you to watch even when they're not doing anything. I mean, the thing that set me off on this path was when I watched Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and there were just large stretches of that, which is just... Brad Pitt feeds his dog and you watch it because it's Brad Pitt. He does it with Uh, a charisma, which I don't know how, but he does it. Exactly. Yeah. And that that's what they're for. That's what these people do. And I have to say it is it is dangerous cutting away from Steve McQueen and Ali McGraw because who who can be more compelling than them at this point? Well, not the opposite too, which I think it doesn't really um play out. Uh, if you like, use that sort of example as from other movies where you've got the main pair and there's another pair which are on the run after them, chasing after yeah. them, Thelma and the Wheeze or, or whatever example you, you want to pick out. Yeah. The couple that you are following, well, mm. cutting away to, I should say, Yeah, they'll have some sort of major role in the end. They'll end yeah. up like scuppering everything and making a mess for the leads, as in that's why the move away. So it shows the comeuppance is coming for him. So we see the comeuppance coming. Yeah, yes. Yeah. I've overworded it, maybe. Yeah, there, there are too many comeuppances, but I get where you're going with this. But yeah, with them, it's just kind of it's Sally Struthers and uh, Ben Johnson to give them their actual names. <laughs> Feels like they've walked in from a very different movie to me. It does. It doesn't really work with them too, I don't yeah. know, I think. Ali McGraw in this, I mean, she got stinking reviews because most people associated her with Love Story, her breakthrough film from two years earlier, which is glutinous. I mean, it's not good, but it set the tone for her to have, I think, one of the weirdest careers of anyone who is at her level of celebrity because she did this and like I say it was a massive hit she ended up marrying Steve McQueen which you'd have to say is a pretty good outcome you know from any movie Uh, but it was a huge hit it really helped her career and then she did nothing for six years just nothing just sort of seemed to voluntarily sit it out she came back and the first three things she did were two sydney lamette movies back to back which yes woman after my own heart uh, and also another sam peckinpah movie which i'd have to say everything i've heard about sam peckinpah on set makes me feel like that would be a once and never again deal but she came back Maybe they had the good sort of chemistry. I don't know. Maybe it's it's a weird career because, I mean, maybe it's not so true with people of our generation. But if you ask someone who was even a child in the seventies if they've heard of Ali McGraw, the answer will be yes. Duh, everyone has. For her to have so few films is really strange, especially of that area. Yeah. 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 If you have the back of like a major hit. Yeah. And I mean, Love Story at the time, for, for what reason? I don't know. People thought it was good. She got an Oscar nomination for it. And then, yeah, she sat down and thought, people really love me as an unthreatening romantic lead. I guess now I'll oh, only do man. intermittent Sam Peckinpah movies. And the other one was with uh, it's Convoy from 78 with Chris Christopherson, who's another bag of joy. Oh, boy, are we doing Convoy on pop screen one day. <laughs> because it's that, that uh, we talked about The Getaway being one of Peckinpah's biggest hits. Convoy was Peckinpah's biggest hit. Because, of course, the world was just waiting for a movie about truckers based on a novelty country and western song from the director of Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia. 
<laughs> 70s were a weird decade, weren't they? <laughs> <laughs> as much as we got new Hollywood, that's that wasn't everything. There was oh. old Hollywood, and old Hollywood was mad at that point. <laughs> So, yeah, I think as a McQueen film, it's great. As a McGraw film, it's great. As a Walter Hill film, it's pretty satisfying. I just think as a Sam Peckinpah film, it is kind of fitful. I will continue looking into his work because I want to track his influence on the Western. But this is kind of enjoyable and stylish, but not quite it for me. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing that I really disagree with there. I I do think it's worth a watch purely on the premise of uh, the scar. I mean, I've commented Mm. before how this sort of arrhythmic, I guess jazz would be the closest um, point for it, really works for me. I fell in love with the Surgeon Suzuki movies that have this sort of wild man jazz to them because they give them a real flavour, a real of its own type sort of uh, identity when a lot of movies that have like, here's a, an orchestra or here's some electric blooping yes, or, yeah. or something. Jazz is so rare in cinema and to see it in a way where it really elevates everything. Mm. I think you really need to get in on that. Even if you know, I'm not a fan of jazz at all. But, but it's about it what just, works in the film, right? Yeah, it just works so well for the film. And yeah. for you to question your tastes with music, I think a movie that does it as flamboyantly as The Getaway does is worth a shout, personally. Yeah. Uh, do we have any recommendations to go with that? Surely it'd be a lover on the run movie, wouldn't it? But I'm not as into those. Well, not that I'm not into them. I just don't know them as well as you do. Mm, mm. Um, but I think the driver, the Walter Hill movie that I mentioned earlier, that is a, a good shout. Um, it's basically like Drive, but the sort of somber 1970s crime ver- movie version. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it also has a great central performance um, from Bruce Dern, and Bruce Dern is Bruce Dern, and I never not have a reason not to watch Bruce Dern. He's so great, yeah. Uh, as Rob says, I am a huge fan of Lovers on the Run movies. I think there are loads you can watch with this, but I'm going to swerve slightly. I mean, yeah, Badlands would probably work. Yes, I think Bonnie and Clyde would probably work, but... The thing that kept coming to mind is actually a more recent film, particularly when we were talking about that score. Did you ever get around to seeing The Old Man and the Gun? Not yet, no. I will, because you've been quite vocal about it, so... Yeah. It's interesting because it is done in that sort of consciously 70s style, and in another movie I might think that that was just an affectation, but in this it does help sort of cement the idea of this film as a a way of taking stock of Robert Redford's whole screen career. And it is another film that knows exactly what movie stars are for. The second Robert Redford and Sissy Spacek meet, you just think, oh yeah, I'm going to watch these people. I'm going to root for them to get together. I don't care that he's a bank robber. I just like these people. And yeah, fantastic score as well. Um, I guess an outsider shot Mm. would be Three Days of the Condor. Oh, which I've never seen, actually. Um, yeah, it's a Sidney Pollock movie. Mm. Uh, it's got Robert Redford in, and Robert Redford, when he was young, was a handsome lad. Oh, so God, if you watch yeah. movies for that, you've got that. Yes. <laughs> but it's another movie which has sort of a very misogynistic um, like t- tone to it, because Jane Fonda's in it in a really kind of sleazy uh, aspect of the, the movie. But... Mm. The reason why I bring it up is that one of the movie star aspects, um, this one also has Max von Sydow in it, which, come on. Oh, yeah, yeah. Come on. Yeah. But it's also like one of these movies where this final scene just changes the complexion of it completely. Okay. Because yeah, Slim Pickens, it's just, you're like, ah, oh, it's Slim Pickens. Come on. Yes. yes. He's a great replacement for a village full of Mexican cannibals. Oh, yeah, text Slim Pickens every day. <laughs> I'm not saying that it's got that sort of cameo on this, but it's just got one of those like killer final lines, which really does change the entire uh, makeup of what you've been watching before it. And it's very, very different, and it's a bit more energetic than the getaways. Okay. 
So if you're enjoying what you're listening to and you want us to help us carry out all of the exciting new plans we have for 2021, you can donate to our Patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash The Geek Show. As discussed recently, going forward, Cinema Eclectica will be a less regular Patreon exclusive. So if you want to hear us talk all the latest movies, that's your only option, really. Yeah, uh, it's not going to be every week. That's a thing. It's going to be much more uh, occasional than it is now. Yes. Yeah. Uh, if you want to do something a bit more straightforward, though, frankly, if we're brutally honest, we'd like the money. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm not judging you, but we would like the money. But if you don't have that to spare, you can simply share us around, uh, leave us a review on your podcast provider of choice. That helps more than you'd imagine. Or simply keep up up to date with all the latest stuff we're doing by following us on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook, on all of which we are at TGS underscore The Geek Show. I think with move, with job interviews, you have to be kind of a, a bit more elusive about why you won the position. Like, say, oh, I, I, <laughs> I think I really do a great job. But in the case of Patreon, I think you can be kind of um, straightforward about it and just say, yeah, we need the money. Please help us out. It's, it's one of the great things the internet has done is it's recently give, really given us all the chance to experience life as a beggar. Hmm. Uh, it's hard to adjust to normal interviews now, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Where do you see yourself in five years' time? Well, much as I am now, but richer. Yeah, which isn't saying much, but... <laughs> <laughs> Perplexed by the pompous, ponderous piffle pervaded by normal art critics? Well, you've come to the right place, because we're not normal. We take a not-so-serious look at the serious worlds of art and literature. Join Sarah, Andrew, Rob and Graham for a piffle-free journey through the cultural landscape of the 21st century. Literary loitering. Because you can't make a cultural omelette without smashing a few eggheads. This is voice actor Bryce Pappenbrook, and you're listening to the Geek Show Podcast Network. Excellent. Thank you. Woohoo, I can make my voice sound good. So if you go over to the site, we've got we've got a lot of stuff on the geekshow.co.uk at the moment, haven't we? Yes, we have. Ewan and Mark have been working through a bit of a backlog and uh, mm. Ewan has discovered Buster Keaton movies through it. Which, as we were discussing the other week, is always a big moment in someone's cinephilic life. Yeah. Before that, he did a monster movie, Amicus Hammer. I can't remember which one it was. Starring Christopher Lee. I think it's Amicus. Yeah, I'm Monster. Or I'm Monster. This is a really awkward title, isn't it? Yeah, I'm Monster. I, comma... Monster, but I got rid of the comma because it's bad for SEO. S- commas are bad SEO people. I didn't oh, yeah, want to no learn this. Searches for comma. I didn't want to learn this when I started doing the, the cinema eclectic, but I've learned it, and there we go. <laughs> and Mark's done uh, Eternal Beauty, which I talked about before. Uh, Craig Roberts, ah. mm, but just just Jim, but he. Mark but liked Sally it. Hawkins, right? Yeah, Mark, Mark liked Eternal Beauty. So, mm. with, with Sally Hawkins, David Fewless, and a few other big names. Yeah, Billy Piper, Alice Lowe. It, uh, I've got to admit, I, I had not seen his last film, but that is the sort of cast who I would watch do pretty much anything. Um, the last one, has, oh, I can never remember his name now. Um, he was the target of the hit... Not a hit. He was in Killer Joe. And he wasn't Joe. He was the guy who wanted to hire Killer Joe. And I never remember his name. Oh, Emile Hirsch. There we go. Craig Roberts, opposite Emile Hirsch. You've had one on the side too, haven't you? Yes. Uh, before that, though, there was uh, Ewan looked at Go West, the first of his... his um, well, the second of his Buster Keaton things. Mm. And I had a go at uh, The Strangers, the 2008 Home Invasion movie. Which is almost ruined by Liv Tyler being awful. Oh, right, okay. I feel that we would have got a very different review of that if it had gone to Mark Cunliffe. Yeah. Um, it... He is very forgiving towards Liv Tyler. Probably, yeah. But she, she should not be in horror movies because she doesn't know about 
this is a, a horror movie which is quite mumbly and quiet. Yeah. And she screams. It's like someone screaming in the microphone when you got the headphones on and you're doing a mic test. And it's like, bloody hell, <laughs> what are you playing at? The old surprise ASMR. <laughs> yes. So that's Liv Tyler's role in that. But otherwise, it's pretty good. If, meanwhile, you are just listening to this show, which, given that you're listening to this show, you probably are. <laughs> playing it safe. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> We have uh, our next director's lottery just next week. We're doing two back-to-back, which we have done before, but not for a while. And we're going to pick out what we're doing now. So, Rob, have you got the randomizer ready? I have. So, for the first director's lottery, we will be doing director number 230. That's 230. Oh, wow. If this, if this is, and it probably will be the last director's lottery we do, I am very happy to go out on this note. That's ominous. It's only Gerard Hurts. Yes, that's kind of fate, isn't it? Yes, <laughs> of course it had to be the mad Slovakian. Of course that's how it all ends. That's been, I mean, that's kind of one of the narratives of Eclectic, isn't it? The discovery of Czech New Wave. Completely, yeah, yeah. That's been a, the big thing for me over the last five years. And I'm, uh, listeners, if you don't know who Gerard Hertz is, the cremator is his his popular hit. Oh, um, um, I think he did Morgiana. I'd love to see that again. And I think you'd really yes. like that. It's a movie which has a cat eye perspective shot from a cat's um, from an actual cat's eye. So, yeah, sort of jumping about and it's wacky. It's a wacky movie, Morgiana. He did a movie about a vampire car once. <laughs> of course he did. <laughs> <sighs> so are we doing two now, are we, of this? Shall we? That would be, yeah, that would be quite exciting. Um, so the other director's lottery we will be doing, I'm assuming before that, mm. will be director number 76. 76. Oh, right. As, as as me as that choice was, yeah. this is you. That's how much you this is. Kinji Fukasaku. Oh, that could go all sorts of places, that one. Mm. Um, he had a career from like Japanese New Wave uh, in the late 50s. Yeah. All the way up to Battle Royale 2, which he died in the making of, and his son took over it and destroyed everything he'd ever <laughs> done in his life. He ruined Kenji Fukasaku's career with one movie. I th- think I have done... Is it Cops v. Thugs? Is that one of his? Yes, it was during his odd years. Kenji Fukasaku I think was an, that is... He's a wacky man. He's a, he's a fun guy. I think that's the only one I can remember us doing, but I might be wrong. Um, I think so. I think yeah. Andrew did Battle Royale 2 for Morbid Curiosity Monday, but that does not count. No, no, it doesn't. But you could go all sorts of ways with uh, Kinji Fukasaku. His career is very, very diverse. Exciting. Hmm. <sighs> Yeah, two two fantastic choices there we came out with. Who could have? It's almost like this isn't random, and we just sort of picked names that that we liked. But no, <laughs> dispelling that idea. This is totally it flipped. Is, it is notable that it has never come up with Michael Winner, even though he is on there. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Um, who else is on there? Uh, the director, what's he called? Ubal. Who's on? He's on there. Yeah, their balls on there. We did do Edward one week. It hasn't all been plain sailing. Yeah, so we've not stacked the deck towards amazing directors. Just so you know. <laughs> they just come up naturally. Yes. So we got a copy of Miss Virginia, which came out on Friday at, uh, I don't think it is a selected cinemas thing, despite the Friday release, but it is available on digital platforms. This stars the very great Uzo Aduba, who was recently in uh, Mrs. America. It is not connected with Miss Juneteenth, which came out a few weeks back. 
is it too much to ask that distributors should just check there's nothing with a really similar title coming out around the same time? Oh, maybe lame me things with like unique titles. Yeah, yeah. Or maybe there's just too many women now. Maybe that's <laughs> it. I'm sure that'll be a that's a rocky road <laughs> on, a, on a Sam Peckinpah episode. I think that's thematically <laughs> unnoticed, but you yeah. know, <laughs> careful now, careful. <laughs> Fair enough, but I, I love Uzo do, but uh, she broke through with crazy eyes in Orange is the New Black and her performance as Shirley Chisholm, the first black woman to run for president in Mrs. America, is a really great performance that I genuinely think the show did not realise how good that was going to be. It's structured so it keeps dragging you away from her, and I'm thinking, well, ah. um this is a movie based on the life of Virginia Walden Ford, who was an activist for educational choice in her native Washington, D.C. It is one of those things where I did not know this story beforehand, and I did a bit of research largely to find out about one supporting character, which we'll get on to Um but I was curious as I watched this about whether this is one of those things that is trying to sell the charter school program that's been very controversial in, in the United States. You may remember that after he did An Inconvenient Truth, Davis Guggenheim directed a documentary called Waiting for Superman, uh, which, yeah. yeah, that was about charter schools. That was pretty divisive. And... Then there was there was a film that didn't get much attention called Won't Back Down, starring Viola Davis and Maggie Gyllenhaal, which was like a fictionalised version of quite possibly this exact story. It was also about the mothers trying to get their districts to accept that their sons could go to a wider variety of schools. Uh, and that was kind of tanked when people accused it of just being propaganda for the charter schools movement. I think what Miss Virginia has that lifts it above that is that it makes that into an empathetic story. I mean, when you hear that charter schools are just about mothers in the inner cities who want to have a, ch a bigger chance to get their kids sent away on scholarships to different better schools you think well you know what's so bad about that that's a fine thing and the problem that its opponents bring up is that it basically means that any child who is remotely gifted gets siphoned off to some out of the district school and the public schools in again these inner city environments that we're being asked to care for end up being, you know, bottom of the league tables, having their fundings cut, generally just left to rot. Uh, I think there's a level of truth in that, but I think it's also kind of hard to take against a woman like Ford who just, you know, would, would like her child to go to school in a neighbourhood with slightly fewer crack dealers. Um, it's a small question, yeah. I think, to ask for, you know. Yeah, but... yeah. So America, I think I, I, guess. I do have some sympathy with charter school opponents, but I think they need to think about how to make this message a bit more sympathetic because Miss Virginia is pulling every heartstring. And in, in as much as I enjoy having my heartstrings pulled and I enjoy having them pulled by an actress as good as Uzo Aduba, uh, I was basically fine with it even as, as though as it got into the second half and it tries to go for a more inspirational tone, I could not help questioning uh, what I was being led to support here. But the opening segments where it's about her, like at the end of a tether, struggling to get her foot in the door, talk, trying to talk to politicians who did not consider her worthy of their time, I think is very good and empathetic and she is very strong in it. Um, it doesn't deviate much from the kind of inspirational activism playbook, but it does it pretty well. The one... <laughs> thing that I could not work out at all is that it has this supporting performance by Matthew Mordine, uh who was in Full Metal Jacket and The Dark Knight Rises. And I cannot work out what I think about this at all. I was Googling yeah. while I was watching it, trying to find out who, who sponsored this bill. 
you know, who sponsored the real life Dixie Chart Schools build? Because I want to know who he's playing. And I could not find it out. I mean, maybe they would just need a bit more searching. But Mordine's performance is as a sort of fictionalized senator. And I would describe it as kind of somewhere between Rand Paul and David Lynch. Wow, that's a, that's a pull, I guess. <laughs> it's such a weird performance. And everything he says is so mannered. His hair is this absolutely insane sort of Mr. Whippy catastrophe. Um, I don't know if this performance is good or not. I might vote for it if it was standing <laughs> for election, but I, I don't know what he's trying to do here. Um in terms of context left out, I thought it was interesting that the real-life Virginia Walden Ford's mother was part of an earlier experiment, which, you know, it, opponents of chart schools would say was the exact opposite in terms of the forcible desegregation of American schools where kids from all black schools were pushed into all white schools as an effort by the government to forcibly smash segregation in education. They knew that would not go without it being the issue being completely forced. I would love to know if her experiences with her mother left sort of gave had any influence on her decision to fight for educational choice in this regard. Um, because I can see some similarities between them. I also think that the politicians who have jumped on charter schools as an example of choice and the free market in action are the ones who were never really comfortable with that aspect of the desegregation process. But um, yeah, in as much as it is, I, I thought it was cute. I'll watch pretty much anything for Uzo do, but I think she's absolutely brilliant. Uh, I wish this lived up to the performance she is giving, but you know what, I'll take it. And that's Miss Virginia, which is out on digital platforms now. I'm not seeing uh, anything that she's been in. Um, mm. Orange is the New Black. Yeah, yeah. I mean, she was a she was a breakout in Orange is the New Black, but um, I think Mrs. America, despite my slight misgivings about how they deal with her character's screen time is a really good series that you should watch and it's you know nine episodes long and the story ends so that's all i ask for <laughs> in television one thing um i want uh, i was thinking when you were talking there is with mm. this most recent spike in in black lives uh, matter mm. after the horrible incidents that have happened over in america in 2020 yeah one of the things that has been popping up as sort of a future for entertainment media is representation. Yeah, and yeah. I do your thought. Like, there's so many fascinating true stories um, mm. in the black experience in America that make great movies. And vitally, when you're doing biopics, America tends to get them kind of uh, backwards first. And it yeah. seems to be interested in them if they're inspirational. But there's so many interesting stories that may come out of this year. Yeah, completely. Uh, I think yeah. I think need to be told really. And when you were talking about uh, the main character's mother, I think that would be a fascinating one. Exactly. Yeah, I was really frustrated that was left out because, I mean, in terms of doing something a bit different with the biopic form, yeah, I'd love to know what two generations, you know, what the difference is there, what the similarities are. I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. Um. To put it in another way. Oh. More Selma, mm. <laughs> less J. Edgar. Yeah, definitely co-sign that, Bill. Yeah, we'll see if we can get a really weird Matthew Mordeen to uh, co-sign that for us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so on that note, our question of the week was which historical eras deserve to feature in more films and I got a few answers on Facebook. Ian Payne starts us off by nicking my answer. Uh, 1649, go the diggers. Yeah, that's going to need a bit more context. <laughs> that for anyone who is not a member of Folk Horror Revival on Facebook was the point after the English Civil War where everything had broken down so much that people 
basically started forming their own kind of utopian Christian socialist communes. And then Oliver Cromwell came in and ruined it all. But for a few years, really good time. Yeah, I'd like to see that sort of movie. That'd be interesting. There is a movie, uh, which I haven't watched like he mean to, from the mid-70s, called Win Stanley, about Gerard Win Stanley, the leader of the Diggers. But there were so many other groups around that time with so many stupid names. There was one called the Muggletonians, Rob. Of all the collections of letters and words and sounds that you could come up with in the English language, that is what they're settled on. That, that was the one. I realise it's sometime before branding became a thing, but come on. Yeah, you could have just, you know, put a lot of words into a hat and then picked them at random. Oh, well, maybe that is what they did. Yes! <laughs> Actually. <laughs> Uh, Mikey Toll says the jiving and roaring 1950s, especially in a Christmas movie. I just like the music, the horror and sci-fi movies, and the male fashion of the Eva. Yeah, there was a movie, I think it was uh, earlier this year. The sci-fi uh, 1950s one, Twilight Zone, um, inspired oh, it to the uh, Tiffany Tongue. The Vast of Night. Yes, The Vast of was Night. that one? That's, mm. That struck out for me. It stood out for me, sorry. Because uh, when you think of 1950s sci-fi, you think of the alien from Planet Z. Yes. Um, genuine 1950s set sci-fi. It, it, kind of interesting, really. So, yeah, I'd agree on that one. Completely, yeah. Uh, and Paul Anthony says, Colonial and Imperial Eva. Kids are just not taught about the horrendous legacy of European powers in developing nations. And, I mean... You've seen how certain rat-like hominids are getting very angry over supermarkets participating in Black History Month. Imagine how livid they would be if there was an actual proper film about King Leopold of Belgium. <laughs> it would be like the bit at the end of Ready or Not. I won't spoil it because not enough people have seen it yet, but it would look like that. Gammon Pocalypse. <laughs> That's, that, yes, yes. I would say that's got to be the name, but kind of, you know, stacks the deck, and that's why we went to see. <laughs> um, over on Instagram, mm. um, Mark Cunliffe of this parish goes by the username I Well Hmm, which is uh, very northern, I guess. I Well Hmm, yeah. Uh, he went with uh, Clement Attlee, always. Plus, it's about time someone did a Tony Ben biopic, too. That's very specific, not just the Eva, but the specific characters, yes. Yes, I mean, if he wants to write the script, I mean, (laughs) he's as good a person as anybody to do it. Uh, What about yourself, Rob? Did you have any particular time periods Um, that you think would be interesting? Well, I always like to see... Well, I've got a bit of context to this. I'm kind of sick of British historical movies being the, the, the fancy hat era. Yeah. So, I'm not being specific, but something which paints the Empire in a very, very bad light, I think there's not enough of that in British cinema. Yeah, because I remember when I watched The Nightingale, the Jennifer Kent movie, and there were many controversial things about The Nightingale, but one of the things that did not seem to bother people, particularly in Australia, is how awful the Empire is in that movie. Because, of course, the Australians were on the shitty end of the stick there, really. You know, oh, yeah. it's yeah. something they can perfectly easily accept. Like, um, James Cook is a bit of a local icon, uh, Teesside, mm. Middlesbrough, the North East. But if you know your history, what you actually know, well, we'll find out, sorry, is that he basically was an idiot who went around the world killing all the brown people he could find. And then got eaten. I mean, it's the slapstick end of the story. Yeah, I mean, there's a movie to be made there, just to shut up all the <laughs> local people. <laughs> but the other one, um, I, think, I don't know my specific dates. I really should, given that this is a point of history that really interests me. I think it was the 1600s, if my memory is correct. Um, mm. But the witch trials. Oh, yes, yeah. Specifically the English witch trials. 
um, Matthew Hopkins, am I getting my names right? I really should have. That's the guy, yeah. yeah the, the true story there is just absolutely horrific. Uh, basically, he is the object of Witchfinder General, but in Witchfinder General, it's hammerfied quite a lot. Yeah. And the true story is truly grotesque. Like he was, he basically died of old age and killed hundreds upon hundreds and hundreds of people. And I find that sort of thing truly fascinating, really. And again, it, mm. it paints old England in such an ugly light. And I think mm. most period British period films are kind of like, oh, nice hats. We like nice hats. <laughs> Both yes. with and hats and you know going to do- dinners and balls. It's like. Oh, Go away. Boring. <laughs> yes. What do you think about it? Downton Abbey started in 2010, and everything that happen, has happened in this decade that's been terrible is probably the fault of Downton Abbey. That's a hill I'm willing to go, go for. Yeah. yeah. I mean, on that note, um, it is a source of absolute amazement to me that I am British, you know, I'm, I'm from Britain, I am living a part of town where there are a lot of Asian people, mm. and yet I first heard about Partition from an old episode of Who Do You Think You Are? I mean, that is a spectacular failure of the education system, I would say. Well, our education, I don't know about you when you were at um, school, college, whatever, but history mm. when I was in the education system was basically World War Two. Oh, God, yeah, yeah. That's about it. The interesting... I, I, I say that um, we did do World War II every single year, and important as it is, I just thought there's got to be a limit to how much a kid needs to know about World War II. We did do some interesting stuff about Charles Grey, uh, the British Prime Minister, who retired to to go and stand up on a big pillar in Newcastle and turn himself into stone. Seems like a weird retirement plan, but that's what he did. He's still there today. Well, if you've got a dream, who's anybody to say (laughs) no to that? Anyway, I I thought Charles Grey seems like a pretty rad guy who went through some real convulsions of history. It was under Grey's time that the right to vote was extended to working class men. Obviously, working class women came later, but still, that was a big change to the established order. Um, And I think that's a part of history that, unless you were specifically taught it like I was, you probably don't know much about it. It would be fascinating to see it happen. The, The general gist, though, personally, is we've got England and the United Kingdom and these little group of islands that we live on have a history which goes back all the way to the Norman Viking conquests mm. like 6th century and further and further and all of our movies are basically about sort of 18th to 20th century Yes, yeah. high society there's so much out there that could be done it's a shame I also have an answer that has nothing to do with Britain, which is really out of the box. Okay. See, I'm not a big fan of sword and sandal movies, and I think I've worked out why that is. It's because they're all about either the Greeks or the Romans. They're never about the last and, frankly, best empire, the Byzantine Empire. That's a very good point. I don't think you've ever seen a a Byzantine Empire movie. And it was amazing at the Uh, During the Byzantine era, uh, there's a reason why Byzantine is now a synonym for very complex. The state was so elaborate and so well run that they actually had a coup d'etat at one point and no one outside the palace noticed. (laughs) The rest of society just kept running. That that calls for like a a death of Stalin sort of (laughs) satire, I feel. (laughs) A lot of it has a very Armando Iannucci vibe, I think. Um, but also, it, it, the Byzantine Empire had my main historical hero, who is Theodora of Byzantium, a working class woman who rose to fame, allegedly performing a deeply disturbing striptease show involving a live goose. <laughs> um <laughs> 
who was a member of a Christian sect that was explicitly banned by the state and lived at a time when nobody who wasn't born into a royal family was allowed to be empress and somehow ended up being empress. That's about as on brand for you as I could imagine, really. (laughs) I mean, people say they want a story of triumph against the odds. The odds in the story of Theodore the First are actually hilarious. Like, you could not have a more unrealistic career goal than her being Empress of Byzantium. And she did it. It's probably what brought the whole whole thing down. <laughs> probably, yeah, actually. <laughs> so, uh, our normal site that we use for new releases is Launching Film, yeah. which has, has crashed, which feels very much like a synecdoche for what's happening in the whole of the British exhibition sector at the moment. Yeah, because Cineworld and Pitch House Cinemas have closed... Audience looking a bit Ooh, that might have closed down by the time this gets released uh, so yeah horrible horrible times uh, but if you do live near a cinema that is still open uh, there are some films coming out that are worth supporting um, there's St Maud, which I am very happy to say I saw a preview screening of last night okay um You've, have you heard anything about this movie, Rob? Um, I just heard the on the preview circuit, on the festival circuit, it's one of the, the big like high hopes for 2020 horror. Mm, yeah. Um, female um, female directed, that's literally all I know about it. Yeah. There are large parts of it where you will not be sure if it quite is a horror movie, but you will be very certain that it is creepy as all hell. It's a story of religious fanaticism and I want to say sexual obsession although like all of the best psychological thrillers you can't actually tell what the hell the main character's problem is and it has a really horrible drizzly wind-blown atmosphere that I liked a lot. I sold. I Mm. doubt I'll be able to see it locally but I'm I'm assuming there'll be some sort of release to cover the fact that cinemas just are closed hang on to your local independent cinema like a life belt listeners because if anyone needs to get through this it's them yes there's also Kajillion Air, which I don't know man it ticks a lot of my boxes and then it has one big X which is that this is written and directed by Miranda July oh no that's oh. she's like patient zero for quirky hips there, isn't she? <laughs> she is, yes. Yeah, it's it's bizarre the way that her stock has risen in recent years, because if there was one director who I thought would, you know, be buried once the big indie quirk bonanza of the Nazis ended, it would, well, actually, it would be Joe Swanberg, and he's still going somehow as well. I think it's all... But he, yeah. he survived, because it's basically... All of his movies cost about 12 pence, so... <laughs> yes, there is that. I'm going to do a horror yeah, movie. Yeah, you know. I'm going to do a horror movie, and he's got a bag for a head. There we go. Sorted. Make two of them. <laughs> Really looking forward to the upcoming release of Freddy vs. Jason vs. Baghead. That guy's a horror icon. <laughs> yes. I will say, one thing that I'm prepared to be positive about, I like Evan Rachel Wood's hair and makeup in Kajillion Air. She's a good actress, actress anyway. Mm. Not actor, I should say. Yeah. When I first saw it, I will admit, I thought, is this another Gloria Steinem biopic? But... No, it's just her style. <laughs> well, if you've got a style, stick to it. Yeah. So yes, uh, we won't be doing any of those this week because, well, it feels like a bad time to try and plan according to the cinema release calendar, but we will be back next week with some Kinji Fukusaku. Yes, indeed. We'll announce what that is over the due course. Could, could be one of like 45 movies. So 
Yes, yeah, I, w- I will be guided by you a little on that front, I think. Yeah. He's known for the um, battles amongst Honor and Humanity mm. franchises and sagas. I have seen Battle Royale and I've seen Cops vs. Thugs, but anything else is new to me. The most famous contribution that Kinji Fukusaku has made to the world of cinema is the badass walking music that was taken in Kill Bill and now appears everywhere in adverts in, in Shrek <laughs> yes. all over the place. That's Kinji Fukusaku, that one. Could we just review that? That track? I'm pretty sure we could spin half an hour out of that. <laughs> yes, it's a preview for Pop Screen. <laughs> <laughs> Well, until then, listeners, uh, thanks a lot for listening. That's been all from Cinema Eclectica this week. I've been Graham. And I've been Rob. See you next week.